So this is for your paper three. It's going to be the section on aggression. So remember, in this section, you will have more than one topic to select from. You are selecting the aggression topic. So what do you need to know for the aggression topic then? You need to be aware of neural and hormonal mechanisms or influences of aggression. The genetic factors that could happen in aggression. Evolutionary and ethological explanations. Social psychological explanations. Institutional aggression and how the media can impact on aggression. So neural influences on aggression or neural mechanisms. So neural can mean the brain structure and neurochemistry. So if we look at the brain structure, we're going to look at the limbic system first. Now the limbic system is a part of our brain and is located at the top of the brainstem and it's generally due to do with our emotions, in particular survival emotions such as fear and anger. Now one part of the limbic system that's been associated with aggression is the amygdala. And it's been found that when this area of the brain is stimulated, it leads to increased levels of aggressive behaviour, while damage to the area reduces aggression. It was also found that surgical removal meant that an animal no longer responds to a stimulus that would have been previously caused rage or aggressive behaviour. The hippocampus is another part of the limbic system and it involves the formation of our long-term memory. So it allows an animal to compare a current threat with a previous past experience that is quite similar. And impairment to this area causes the amygdala to respond inappropriately to a sensory stimulus, resulting in aggressive behaviour. So what happens is we're not responding in a way that we would do. So it, our long-term memory is hasn't formed so we are responding in an aggressive manner when we shouldn't have. So the strengths of the limbic system causing or being associated with aggression is there are supporting evidence. So a longitudinal study of 56 male participants with varying histories of violence. The MRI scan showed that those with lower amygdala volumes displayed higher levels of aggression and violence, suggesting there is an association between the amygdala and aggressive behaviour. However, we could include a counter argument with this um, evaluation point. We could talk about it being on um, male participants. So therefore it might not be representative to females. It would be um, beta bias to apply it to females. Also, we have supporting evidence for the hippocampus. Okay, so it's found the hippocampus in the right and left hemispheres were different in size in convicted violent criminals. So suggests that hippocampus plays a role in human aggression. Again, we could talk about the sample bias of this research. It's only done on violent criminals, might not actually explain aggressive behaviour in everyday citizens or the target population. So the next part of the neural influences is the neurochemistry. So we're going to look at the neurotransmitter serotonin. And serotonin generally has a calming inhibitory effect on our neurological firing in the amygdala. It has been found that when serotonin levels are low, aggression is more likely, whereas normal levels of serotonin in the orbital frontal cortex is linked to reduced firing of neurons, which is associated with self-control behaviour. Therefore, a decrease in serotonin affects that mechanism and it reduces our self-control and it increases impulsive aggressive behaviour. Drugs that lower serotonin levels are associated with an increase in aggression, but not men. Okay, it's important when we are doing our AO1s that we are being explicit in relating it to aggression. So use the words aggression and aggressive behaviour. Okay, we have supporting evidence for this. So it's found that lower levels of serotonin were associated with increased aggression in monkeys. Again, we could include a counter argument in that evaluation point to extend it even further by talking about the use of animals and that we should be cautious when extrapolating the findings to humans. Human aggression is a far more complex behaviour than that of monkeys. So the hormonal influences, so we're going to look at testosterone. So testosterone is an androgen. It produces male characteristics. 
generally that is linked to aggression. It acts on the areas of the brain that are involved in controlling aggression and it was found that by removing the source of testosterone in different species caused a reduction in aggression and when it was restored to normal levels aggressive behaviour returned. So high levels of um, testosterone are linked to human aggressive behaviour. So when the salivatory testosterone was measured in violent and non-violent criminals, they found those who had the highest levels of testosterone had a violent history of crime, whereas those with the lowest levels committed only non-violent crimes. Again, we could talk about this not being a representative sample. Some research has shown no correlation between testosterone and actual violence in male prison. So it was found that testosterone may, may actually promote status seeking behaviour and aggression is just one type of behaviour that will lead to gaining higher status. So we can't actually say there is a relationship between testosterone and aggression. It might be a lot more complex than originally been suggested. Okay, genetic influences. And again, this is a biological explanation. So we're gonna look at family studies and the MAOA gene. So family studies have been used, we can use twin studies. So monozygotic twins, remember, they share 100% of their genes, their DNA, they are identical twins. Whereas dizygotic twins only share 50% of their genes. They are just siblings that have been born at the same time. They're non-identical twins. And it was found that a concordance rate of 87% for aggressive behavior in MZ twins, so monozygotic twins, compared to 72 for DZ twins. So that would apply that aggression does appear to be genetic. Research has found that genes account for more than 40% of individual differences in all types of aggression. So we'll look at this when we look at the evaluation, but an, a weakness with twin studies is um, they're still raised in the same environment and also MZ twins are more likely to be treated more similarly because they are identical so people will treat them as if they're the same person therefore they have a greater shared environment than DZ twins so we can't really separate nature and nurture in this um, way so one way to overcome that is through the use of adoption studies so a study of over 140,000 adoptions in Denmark found a significant positive correlation between the number of convictions for a criminal violence among the biological parents and um, the children that had been adopted, particularly if the parent was male, the father. So that would suggest that even without that nurture element, that environmental element of being around a violent father or a criminal father, still the child was more likely to be a criminal themselves, suggesting that it is genetic. So evaluation. Research has relied on parental or self-reports of aggressive behaviour. So therefore there could be differences in perception. People might lie, so social desirability bias. Concordance rates are not 100%, therefore it can't be purely genetic. It's only offering one explanation. So the biological approach, the genetic approach, doesn't offer a whole explanation. And as I mentioned, shared environment, MZ twins are more likely to be treated more similarly. So the MAOA gene we need to be aware of. You need to be aware of this specifically because this is specifically mentioned on the specification. So you could get asked about this. So the MAOA gene is responsible for the production of the protein monoamine oxidase. And that this protein allows the metabolizing of noradrenaline, serotonin and dopamine. And the dysfunction in this gene can result in these neurotransmitters not being broken down. So if we end up with too much adrenaline, it can cause hypersensitivity in the fight or flight response and individuals might overreact in an external stimulus and perceive a threat when there isn't one and behave more aggressively. If dopamine isn't broken down or there is excessive levels of dopamine, 
it is linked to aggressive behaviour. Serotonin, as we mentioned earlier, has an influencing calming effect. So low levels have been implicated in the reduction of the control over impulsive behaviour. So in a study of 28 male members of a large Dutch family who were repeatedly involved in impulsively aggressive violent criminal behaviours, such as rape, attempted murder and physical assaults, it was found that the men of the family had abnormally low levels of the MAOA in their brains and the low activity version of the MAOA gene, suggesting that this is, has an influence on aggressive behaviour. Again, you could evaluate this piece of research as part of your AO3. So you can talk about it being from the same family, therefore we can't separate the nature nurture it could be that they have observed through social learning theory and seen violent behaviour and criminal behaviour be rewarded, therefore they're more likely to imitate it and copy it themselves. So we've got the strengths. So research study in Finland added to the research to support that the MAOD gene is implicated in severe violent behaviour such as murder. However, it's highly reductionist so it's biologically reductionist at the lowest level. It reduces the complex phenomena of human aggression to a single simple component. So it breaks it down to a mutation of the MAOA gene. Whilst the influences of genetics may play a role in aggressive behaviour, reducing it to a single component ignores other potential influences such as situational factors. Ethological explanations of human aggression. So ethology is where we learn about humans and human aggressive behaviour by studying other animals. And Lorenz believed that aggression was an innate adaptive response. So it was something that we have evolved to have and because it aids survival. So it can aid survival by seeing off predators. So for example, if a group of geese hiss at a fox, even though the fox would win, a group of them hissing might drive the fox off. Therefore, the geese, of geese survive and they pass on this aggressive response to offspring. Also, it allows us to gain resources. So, aggression was aimed at members of the same species when competing for territory or sexual partners. However, he also argued that some animals are so fierce they could easily damage each other when fighting for this, these resources. So therefore, this links into the idea that aggression is generally ritualistic. So we display teeth or claws. Um, it doesn't always become physical because of that damage that could be caused. In particular, intraspecies, so between species, aggression usually ends in an appeasement. So to prevent the damage to the loser too. It wouldn't have been adaptive if every time animals fight or got aggressive, that member, a member of the species died. For an appeasement to be adaptive, it it means that the existence of the species will carry on. You also need to be aware of innate releasing mechanisms, and they are an inbuilt psychological response or structure. They act as a filter to identify threatening stimulus in the environment. An environmental, environmental stimulus, so a facial expression, activates this IRM, the innate releasing mechanism, which then triggers or releases a fixed action pattern, so the FAP. So the FAP is a pattern of behaviour that is triggered by the IRM, and Lee argues that it is relatively unchanging and it's found in every individual of the species. So it is ritualistic and it is universal. And it follows an inevitable course which cannot be altered before it's completed. So for example, when a male sickleback fish enters another's territory, its distinctive red underbelly is a sign that triggers the IRM, which then it activates the fixed action pattern of aggression. So we have um, supporting evidence. So Inuit Eskimos use song jewels to settle disputes. So this is a ritualized display. And it's also seen in other cultures where aggression is com 
common, such as the Yano Mano people of South America. However, we have some weaknesses. So it's argued that learning and experience interact with innate factors in complex way ways. So research also shows there are subtle differences between conspecifics in the production of aggressive behaviour. So aggressive behaviour might not be as fixed as Lorenz believed. Also, Lorenz believes that predators with powerful natural weapons have instinctive inhibitors against them uh, to stop them using them on members of their own species because remember it wouldn't be adaptive if they went around killing lots of members of their own species because the whole species could be wiped out. However, male lions and chimpanzees routinely kill members of their own species. So that goes against that idea that Lorenz put forward. Also, performing aggressive behaviour can actually increase aggression rather than decrease the likelihood for further aggression. So the ritualistic aggression might not be as good at preventing a predator from attacking. Also, human behaviour is far more flexible than non-human. We can respond to environmental challenges more effectively. Non-human animals rely on stereotypical fixed patterns of behaviour to respond to environmental changes. However, this might not be the case for humans and might not actually explain human aggression. So evolutionary explanations of aggression. So we're going to look at how evolutionary theory will suggest that we are aggressive amongst our species. So it could be for sexual competition. Now, ancestral males seeking access to females would have to compete with other males, so sexual competition. And one way in which they could eliminate the competition was through aggression, so physical competition. And males who use aggression successfully were more likely to have reproductive success and therefore pass on this aggressive traits to offspring. So it's argued that male traits imply that competition with other males did take place among ancestral males. So males having 75% more muscle mass than women suggests that males had to compete with other males and be aggressive in the past. Sexual jealousy can also be another explanation. So male aggression could happen because of sexual jealousy, which is the result of paternal uncertainty. So remember, men can never be 100% certain that they are the father of the offspring. And they are at the risk of cuckoldry, so raising another man's child as their own. And a consequence of that is he might unwitt unwittingly invest resources into that offspring. Therefore, the adaptive functions of sexual je jealousy might be used uh, to stop the mate from being sexually unfaithful, so sexual infidelity. So mate guarding strategies could reduce the risk of cuckoldry. Bus identified several mate retention strategies that have evolved for the purpose of keeping a mate. And they include the use of violent or threats of violence to prevent her from straying as well as violence towards the perceived love rival. So aggression could be used in that way to prevent risk of cuckoldry. Warfare is another example of where we might have evolved aggression. So war is dangerous and costly, so therefore it might not be seen to have an evolutionary advantage. However, Smith states that human warfare started to obtain valuable resources to attract mates and to forge inter intra group bonds. So displays of aggressive behaviour and bravery are attractive to females. The absence of such behaviour reduces the attractiveness of males. Therefore, if um, a man displays aggressive behaviour, they're attractive to a female, they're more likely to have reproductive success and pass on that trait to their offspring. Also, aggression in combat can also increase the status of the warrior and that would lead to peers respecting them more, increasing the bond between them and other males in the group. Male warriors in traditional societies tend to have more sexual partners and more children, suggesting that war could actually lead to reproductive success and that aggressive behaviour being passed down through generations. So let's look at the evaluation. 
Daly and Wilson found that many tribal societies give higher status to those who have committed murder, even in societies such as the USA. The most violent gang members often have the highest status amongst their peers. However, it fails to explain why there is cruelty found in human conflicts on a wide scale. It doesn't explain why humans might torture or mutilate their enemies when they have been defeated or not even a threat. Also, there are sex differences due to socialization rather than down to evolutionary. So parents are more likely to explain why misbehavior was wrong to girls, but punish boys physically, and that could lead to an increase in male physical violence. So it might not be an evolutionary trait, it might be down to socialisation, so it might be down to the nature side of the nature-nurture debate. It might be down to our environment rather than an innate response. Also, we have gender bias. It doesn't reflect the behaviour of women in warfare. Women warriors and female participants in war are rare. Warfare doesn't increase reproductive fitness as such as compared to males. Also, aggression can lead to negative consequences. So ostracizing, injury or death, and that can be maladaptive. So does aggression actually outweigh the costs? Moving now onto the social psychological explanations. So you need to be aware of the frustration aggression hypothesis. Now Dullard said it's based on the psychodynamic explanation of catharsis. So Freud believed that the drive for aggression was innate. He believed that the only way to reduce aggression was to engage in an activity which released it. So we'd often feel better because we had got it off our chest. It was cathartic for us to display an aggressive act. So it is argued that if we experienced frustration, it leads to aggression. An aggression is a cathartic release of the build-up of frustration. And if the individual is prevented from achieving a goal by some external factor, this will lead to the frustration which will always lead to aggression. We can have sublimation, so using aggression in an acceptable activity such as sport, or displacement, so directing the aggression towards something or someone else. The aggression may not always be directed at the source of a uh, frustration which could be abstract such as the lack of money or power or the because the risk of punishment is too high aggression can be displaced if it is impossible to behave aggressively towards the source of frustration so displacement involves finding a scapegoat and aggression is sometimes displayed indirectly also, unjustified frustration produces the most aggression. So it's found that people said that they would be angry if a bus failed to stop if they were waiting, so it was unjustified, rather than if a bus didn't stop because it had an out-of-service sign, so it was justified why it didn't stop. So we have supporting evidence so that mass killings are often caused by social and economic difficulties within society. So frustrations typically lead to scapegoating and discrimination and aggression towards these groups. Also, uh, a study carried out among Swedish footballers or football fans found that when a team's performance worsened or dropped, so that would cause frustration, the supporters were more likely to throw things on the pitch and were more likely to fight the opposing supporters. So they directed the frustration from the team performing badly onto uh, the football pitch, so taking it out on an object, or members of the uh, opposition, so someone else. Bandura claims that frustration produces only generalised arousal, and SLT, so social learning theory, determines how that arousal will be influenced. So he argues that social learning theory is a better explanation of aggression, frustration, aggression. Also, behaving aggressively is actually more likely to lead to more aggression rather than less aggression. So Bushman found that aggressive behaviour kept aggressive thoughts and angry feelings active in memory. So directly contradicting the idea that aggression would be cathartic. 
Also, not all aggression is caused by frustration. So it was found that as temperatures increase, the likelihood that pitchers would display aggressive behaviour towards the batters also increased. So that was a research study on baseball. Okay, so it wasn't the frustration that was causing the aggression, it was um, temperature. So social learning theory is another explanation that you need to be aware of. So Bandura says that aggression can be learned through indirect observation. And a child will learn to be aggressive through imitation. And it happens through four meditational processes. So when you describe these four meditational processes, you need to be explicit in relating them to aggression. So attention, a personal child must attend to the aggressor. So they must pay attention to them. They need to pay attention to an act of aggression carried out by a role model. Retention, the child needs to remember the aggression that they have seen. Reproduction, the individual needs to be capable of reproducing the behaviour, so they need to have the same physical capabilities. So aggression displayed by superheroes is less likely to be imitated because the child doesn't possess the same physical capabilities to carry out the behaviour, whereas aggression displayed by a peer may be more likely to be imitated because they do possess the same physical capabilities. Motivation, a child must expect that they will get some kind of reward from carrying out the aggressive behaviour. It doesn't necessarily have to be materialistic, but it could be linked to gaining a higher status for the aggressive act. In addition, the observer needs to have levels of self-efficacy, so self-confidence in their ability to replicate the behaviour. And the role model must be similar to the child, either in age and gender or they need to be in a position of power or authority, so for example a parent or a teacher. So we have some strengths of this explanation. So Phillips found that daily homicide rates in the US almost always increased the week following a major boxing match. So practical applications, you could increase the number of police forces, force presence so after that. There are cultural differences, so it can explain why the Kunsang of the Kalahari Desert display low levels of aggression. So when children fight or argue, they aren't rewarded or punished. So therefore there is an absence of this reinforcement. We have supporting evidence, so Bandura, children who had witnessed the adult being aggressive to the baby doll were most likely to, more likely to behave aggressively towards the doll, whereas children who had saw the adult be punished were less likely to be aggressive towards the baby doll. However, there are ethical issues in exposing children to aggressive behaviour with the knowledge that they may reproduce it. So therefore, experimental studies are no longer allowed to take place. Therefore, it's difficult to test the hypothesis. So it weakens the scientific credibility of the approach. Also, it only focuses on the environmental factors that influence aggression. It doesn't take into account biological factors such as serotonin or the MAOA gene. De-individuation proposes that individuals engage in aggressive behaviour when they lose their sense of identity, so when they become part of a group. The theory suggests that the loss of identity can cause individuals to behave more aggressively as they lose their self-awareness and are less likely uh, to be worried about their actions and be being evaluated by others, which can cause people to lose their inhibitions about engaging in aggressive behaviours. So Zimbardo stated that being part of a crowd can diminish awareness of our identity. In a large crowd, a person is faceless and anonymous. People don't behave aggressively normally because they are identifiable. Being anonymous reduces the inner restraints and increases behaviours that are usually inhibited. The larger the group, the greater the anonymity. So in the Stanford Prison Experiment, Participants who display or who played the role of the guards were in a de-individuated state. They behaved aggressively towards the participants, so they wore mirrored sunglasses, they were in a uniform, they were less likely to be identified. Also, wearing mirrored sunglasses makes people feel greater anonymity, which increases the experience of de-individuation. So supporting evidence by Zimbardo again, groups of four female undergraduates were required to deliver electric shocks to another student to aid learning. Half the participants wore bulky lab coats with hoods that hid their faces and they sat in a cubicle and were never referred to by their name. The other half wore normal clothes and were given name tags. 
those that are in the de-individuation condition, so those that had the hoods and weren't, weren't referred to as named, shocked the learner for twice as long as those in the drop condition. Also, we have supporting evidence from Dinah. They observed uh, 1,300 trick-or-treating children on Halloween. They wore costumes which prevented them from being recognised and went from house to house in large groups. They were more likely to steal money and sweets because they were in the de-individuated de state. However, it's oversimplistic. There are other theories that can explain human aggression, such as the biological approach, and the biological influences are completely ignored. Also, it's gender bias. It doesn't acknowledge that men and women may differ in their aggressive behaviour. Dinah also found that males were far more likely to behave aggressively under the de-individuation condition than females. So, institutional aggression. An institution is a place where there are strict rules that give little choice to the members of that institution. So, for example, schools, armed forces, prisons and mental institutions. Institutional aggression refers to the aggressive behaviours within that institution. And it could be a result of dispositional factors, so personalities or situational factors. So the situational is the deprivational model. You need to be aware that situation means deprivation. Now aggression is a result of the internal factors within the prison setting and it focuses on the deprivations that the inmates experience on a daily basis. Syke argued there was five deprivations. So we have deprivation of liberty. This refers to the loss of civil rights. Um, both temporary and permanent. Deprivation of goods and services, so that refers to the manner in which the inmates are deprived of goods and services they could obtain in the community if they were free. Deprivation of heterosexual relationships refers to the lack of female companions within prisons. Deprivation of autonomy, inmates realise that they cannot make basic choices for themselves and deprivation of security, so the potential threats and to their personal safeties that exist within the prison. So McCorkle found that there was a relationship between overcrowding, lack of privacy, lack of meaningful interaction and peer violence within prisons. And also there are practical applications. So most violence happens in environments that are hot and noisy. Wilson found that a change to such deprived environments reduced the violence conducted within Woodhall Prison. However, there is contradictory evidence. So data analysed from 58 US prisons found that race, age and criminal history were the only significant factors in inmate violence. So they found lack of deprivation had no significant influences on aggression. Dispositional, so that's to do with the personalities, is the importation model. So this model suggests that prisoners bring their own social histories and traits with them into the prison environment and these influence their behaviour within the prison. Such men, because they are predominantly males, bring in with them ready-made way of behaving, and they simply apply these to the new institutional setting. Erwin and Cressy recognised the importance of different prisoner subcultures and claim that inmates who enter prison with certain personality traits, so values and attitudes and experiences, are more likely to engage in interpersonal conflict than other inmates. The aggression acted out in prisons is not specific to that institution, but it was acted out in the wider society and that's why they've ended up in prison. So even evaluation then, it was found that the code of the street belief system affects inmate violence, especially in prisoners who lacked family support and were involved in gangs before they were imprisoned, suggesting they've imported that ready way of behaving. However, we have contradictory evidence. So a study of over 800 male inmates found no evidence in the relationship between previous gang membership and misconduct within prisons. So how could the media influence aggression then? So films and TV and computer games are two ways in which we can be exposed to aggression through the media. Now we're going to look at lab experiments, longitudinal studies and meta-analysis. So lab experiments, so it's been consistent findings that those who watched violent scenes later displayed more aggressive behaviour than those that don't. So it's found that children who viewed non-violent films uh, were less likely to be rated as aggressive compared to those who watched violent films. 
Huseman studied children at the ages of 6 to 10 and then again 15 years later and found that habitual early exposure to TV violence predicted adult aggression later in life. The relationship was persistent even when the possible effects of socio-economic status, intelligence and differences in parenting styles were controlled. Meta-analysis of 431 studies found a significant effect for the exposure of media violence on aggressive behaviour, thoughts and feelings. Short-term effects were greater for adults, whereas the long-term effects were greater for children. So it's found through computer games that participants blasted opponent with white noise, so that would be an aggressive act, for longer after watch playing a violent video game, compared to when they played a slow-paced puzzle game. Longitudinal studies have surveyed children between the ages of 7 and 9 at two points during the school year. Children who had high exposure to violent video games became more verbally and physically aggressive and less pro-social. The meta-analysis carried out found a small increase in aggressive behaviour following exposure to violent video games. All of this suggests that media does influence aggressive behaviour. However, there are loads of weaknesses to this area. The relationship between media violence and aggressive behaviour has been overstated. So it was found that studies where aggression was measured, the relationship between media violence, exposure and aggression is almost zero. So it's a very weak relationship. Also, there are methodological problems. So Livingstone found that most research is in America and it used unrepresentative samples such as male students. So therefore we've got that culture and gender bias there. It'd be beta bias to apply it to all cultures and to females. Artificial measures of aggression. So delivery of noise blasts to other participants are typically used as the dependent variable and it doesn't reflect real life aggression and how media influences it. Also, it states that a player's frustration and failure during a game, not the violent content that causes the aggression. So think back to the frustration aggression hypothesis. So it was found that in both violent and non-violent games it was difficulty of the game that led to aggression and frustration. You also need to be aware about these three components and how this links into media influences. So desensitization, disinhibition and cognitive priming. Desensitization is when through regular watching of violent acts on TV, physiological arousal tends to reduce and even disappear altogether, so that many people become less likely to have a reaction each time they watch the programme. So we gradually become less responsive to and emotionally concerned by acts of violence because we have seen them so much on TV. So therefore we expect an increased viewing of violent behaviour following an increased viewing of violent programmes. It's assumed that viewers become less sensitive to and less concerned about violence when they watch it repeatedly. So there is evidence supporting this. So Bushman found that participants who played violent video games for 20 minutes took longer to respond to someone injured in a stage fight than those who had viewed non-violent games. However, most research into the effects of desensitization have not used the representative samples. Male students tend to be used, so the conclusions drawn about all viewers, including women, so that is beta bias. Disinhibition happens when watching or playing violent media can legitimise the individual's use of violence in their own lives because it undermines the social sanctions that normally happen and inhibits such behaviour. Disinhibition can have an immediate effect and a long-term effect on um, human aggression. So violence on TV or in a computer game triggers a state of physiological arousal, which leads to greater probability of behaving aggressively. In this aroused state, inhibitions are temporarily suppressed by the drive to act. In the long term, when violence is justified or left unpunished on television, the child feels less inhibited about behaving aggressively again. So Goranson showed people a boxing match where there was two alternative endings. The participants who did not see the negative consequences, so the loser died, were more likely to behave aggressively after viewing the fight than those who did see the consequences. 
This supports the claims that disinhibition is more likely when the negative consequences are not made apparent to viewers. However, it's been suggested that disinhibition depends on other factors. Younger children are more likely to be affected because they are drawn into high action violent episodes without considering the motives or consequences. So it demonstrates that the relationship between medium violence and disinhibition is not a straightforward one and that it is mediated by a number of different factors and characteristics. Cognitive priming. Cognitive priming refers to the idea that watching violence leads to people to store memories or scripts of violent acts which they activate later in a similar situation. A script is a stored way of behaving in social situations. When a person watches a violent programme, the viewer is primed to respond in a similar way. So it's found that cognitive priming by an aggressive stimulus caused individuals to make hostile attributions about behaviour of other people, increasing the likelihood of behaviour being aggressive. So it's Joseph Fon that found that boys who watched a violent television programme involving the communication via a walkie-talkie. They then were asked to play floor hockey. When the boys were given instruction via a walkie-talkie or a tape recorder, the boys who received the instructions from the walkie-talkie showed more aggressive behaviour than those who had received instructions via the tape recorder, suggesting that they had formed an a cognitive prime towards the walkie-talkie. However, Atkins suggests that film and game realism is an important factor in the relationship between exposure to violent media and the priming of aggressive thoughts and behaviours. The fictional violence in some computer games, for example, may not have the same primary effects of games with more realistic violence, therefore would not be as likely to produce aggressive behaviour. So actually, does violent films and games actually lead to aggressive behaviour? Atkins is suggesting that it probably doesn't. It doesn't lead to a cognitive prime because it is unrealistic.